Hello and welcome to The Cinephiles, where this week we continue our exploration of Ken Burns' epic miniseries, The Civil War. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a voiceover artist, uh, writer, producer, and host over at Collider and host of the, uh, co-host of the Geek Buddies and the Top Ten Show. And I have pulled out my sword for this one. So, because we're getting towards the end of the war. No, is that a cavalry sword? Ooh, good question. Um, or is that, or is that like Lee's sword that was surrendered? To it was not Maddox. Lee's sword. That's for damn sure. Even though I'm a Virginian, grew up in a Virginian. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, the cavalry sword. Absolutely. Because yeah. we're um, about to get into some bloody, bloody battles. It's true. Um, and. Uh, This is the, you know, as we said in our last episode, this is very unusual for us. This is the largest thing we've ever done. This is on television. This is a huge documentary. And and one of the things about it, you know, normally on the cinephiles, we go through really beat by beat, going through every single moment in a film. And obviously in our first episode, we didn't do that. We Mm. skipped a whole bunch. Uh, We moved fairly quickly through, I think we did our first five episodes. So that's like six and a half, seven hours worth of material. So stuff we skipped and all of it, because I think the documentary is so great, is really good. But Mm. there is one thing that we skipped that I wanted to touch on just because it's just so profound to me and harder to describe, okay. which is in the last episode, which is largely about Gettysburg. Yeah. We talked a lot about Gettysburg, but there was a character, a, a real person that pops up that is sort of detached from the narrative. Okay. And what they start is they start by talking about this uh, escaped slave who goes back and joins the Union Army and goes back and ends up killing his master in the Civil War. Right. And that in 18... 18- 83, he had a daughter, and that daughter's name is Daisy Turner. Mm-hmm. And Daisy Turner appears in the documentary at 104 years old. Right. And she is clearly ill. She, in fact, died maybe six months after wow. filming this. She died in uh, 1988. Right. She is reciting this poem. I am a soldier, and my speech is rough and plain. I'm not much used to writing, and I hate to give you pain. But I promised I would do it. And he thought it might be so. If it came from one that loved him, perhaps it would ease the blow. They don't talk about it. They don't explain much about her life. You just cut to her. And she's saying this poem from the Civil War about the death of a soldier. By this time, you must surely guess the truth I fain would hide. And you pardon me rough soldier words while I tell you how he died. And it is just really profound. And I don't know how you feel about watching her. Isn't she doing it from memory? Oh, yeah. It's absolutely. 104 years old. Yeah. Still delivering a memorized poem like this with this kind of weight. And I don't think you needed to say anything. Which right. Is, which the thing is, what's so great about this documentary, Steve, at times, it just lets the moment breathe. Yep. And for you to enjoy it. Uh, and let it affect you as you are going to take that poem or you're going to take uh, whatever is happening on the screen. And I think this is one of those moments, like the letter, yeah. it's one of those moments where you hear this poem and you just go, oh, wow. Like the eloquence of language uh, and what is being said here and the weight and the emotion of it to give you a window into what this experience was like from the ground floor. It's so... I can't even quite describe it. I mean, she's she's obviously ill. She's obviously yeah. frail. She I, she almost her eyes are closed. You don't know what she's seen, and the camera is closer to her, yeah. so that when she moves, the camera the camera operator doesn't know what she's going to do, and so he has trouble adjusting to her. All of which makes it kind of more intimate and more yeah. real. And there's something about like, okay, this woman is alive, being filmed in the eighties, nineteen eighties, right. And her father was a slave who killed his own master as a soldier in the Civil War. And that connection, like it just, it, it, just, it just speaks for itself. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. You know, there's a great uh, ti- uh, documentary on the Titanic that a and did a three-hour documentary. Mm. And they interview one of the last remaining survivors wow. for it. And she was five years old or seven years old right. on the Titanic. And her daughter or granddaughter is there with her to help her talk about her memories. And... That's what we're. That's what's we're going to lose, or we have lost here, which is why these documentaries are so important, and why they need to be passed down like scrolls 
or like ancient texts. They need to be passed down over and over again so that we don't forget our history and our foundation. And this letter, this poem rather, is one of those really important things to hear, you know, because as much as Elijah Hunt Rhodes and um, uh, the, the other... Sam Watkins. Sam Watkins, we get their uh, stuff. There's also something from the slavery side of things, you know, and we do have a letter coming up in episode six from this father to his kids mm. back there. That is also very poignant. So, but this, she's almost in a trance yeah. when she's doing it. Uh, and probably because she probably did this since she was like a young girl. And so it's so ingrained in her, that poem that was probably taught to her by her uh, uh, father that, you know, it's just her way of always remembering this important moment in her life. Well, I think it brings home that this thing that I think the movie is doing so subtly in so many different ways, which is that this is not ancient history. Yeah. This is our history. This is something that we you know, within our lifetimes could have met, I, you and I could have met Daisy Miller Absolutely. And, or Daisy Turner and had this, had a conversation with her. Like this isn't actually, even though it seems like so Far long away. ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it isn't. To think we are to have here soon what I've seen so many times, the awful loads and trains and boatloads of bloody and pale and wounded young men again. For that is what we certainly will have. I see all the signs here. Walt Whitman. Um, so episode six begins with hearing the words of Walt Whitman, which is a character we haven't talked that much about, mm -hmm. uh, but he appears throughout uh, the Civil War documentary and obviously one of the great poets of American literature and that he was a worked as like in the hospitals during the Civil War. And it seems as if that was a profound and shattering and life-changing experience for Walt Whitman. And what's so interesting, again, it's the juxtaposition of the words and the images that what we hear him talking about is the wounded soldiers coming home. Mm -hmm. And it is sad and bloody and painful what he's saying. But what we're seeing is a photograph of soldiers who are bathing in a river. And they look young and had just like a bunch of young guys. And I think that juxtaposition of the young life that we can understand, hey, these are a bunch of guys going swimming, mm -hmm. And this, the voice talking about the wounded men coming home from war, again, it's this thing Ken Burns does over and over again, which is makes mm -hmm. these wounded soldiers human like us. Yep. And again, we hear kind of what's going on in the world. We hear that about rebellion in China and conquering of Turkestan and Tolstoy finished war and peace that year and Louis Pasteur pasteurized wine. And it's the first time that In God We Trust appeared on a U.S. coin, mm -hmm. which I find to be just sort of a fascinating detail that in the middle of the Civil War, yeah. that's when those words became part of our currency. Mm -hmm. And we get a little bit more of the status of the war, which is that the Union ships are now controlling the Mississippi yeah. uh, because we have Vicks Vicksburg, um, but the there's no end in sight to the war, even even after the defeat of Lee at Gettysburg. Yeah, and at this point, Sherman is now in command of the entire Western Army, and he is heading off to Atlanta. <sighs> and now we get our title, 1864 Valley of the Shadow of Death. Hmm. And the first story we get in the episode is about this dusty, rumpled looking guy <laughs> that shows up at the Willard Hotel, which is the famous hotel in uh, D.C. Yep. He asked for a room. He's with his son. And they say, oh, sorry, we don't have any rooms. Maybe something in the attic or in the back or something. <laughs> and he goes, okay, I'll take whatever you have. And he signs his name in the register, U.S. Grant. Word spread quickly that the man Lincoln had recently placed at the head of all the Union armies was in the hotel. And when he and his son entered the crowded dining room, everyone stood and cheered. That's a great opening. Yeah. Absolutely. He hasn't bothered to pin his rank on his uniform because that's Grant. He's just one of those. He's just a dude, man. Yeah. Um, and he has just been promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General. The last person to be a Lieutenant General was Lieutenant General George Washington. Yeah. And he had with uh, he has an army of 530,000 men. It is the largest army in the world. Incredible. Um, one of the things that I've read historical novels of other areas like uh, that take place like in the opening of Japan and and they're and they talk about what's going on in the war in the world at that time and what's going on in the Civil War is freaking out the entire world. I'm sure. Yeah, because of the scale of it and the number of deaths. Yeah. There are so many battles that this country had to fight just to stay a country. Yeah. Right. Like the Civil. I mean, the Revolutionary War just to become a country. The War of 1812, just to be able to stay 
yep. as a country and not get taken over again. And then the Civil War, just to not explode as a country. So we've survived so many battles at the beginning of our uh, uh, creation that it's really incredible that we're still around as yeah. a country. Plus, we got the Mexican American War, but that doesn't fit into that narrative exactly. <laughs> Not really. That's more like, hey, First created that. <laughs> no, that's a Spanish American. The Spanish American War. Oh, Mexican American War is just like, hey, look at all that land over there. <laughs> we don't think these brown people should own it. Yeah, we would like to take it. There you go. Um, Standard so operating man- procedure. Manifest destiny. And then what happens in the film? And this is something I've been excited to talk about uh, for a long time, which mm. is that we've gone through five episodes, seven ish hours of material or six and a half or something yeah and we've met these characters of grant and lee and they've been key important figures in the story but we have not gotten a biography of them yet and now we're going to get biographies of grant and lee and this is just something in filmmaking that i think about all the time which is that when you are doing a film a narrative film a documentary or or even doing this podcast there's a certain amount of information that you want to get out i need to tell you this information right and what you have to determine is when am i going to do that And even in a documentary like this, where there's so much information and so much education happening, and I I bet money that Ken Burns would agree with this, is that the first job is to entertain. Yeah. Is that if I don't have you emotionally involved in my story, I can't give you the information. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was doing the shark documentaries or whatever, I had lots of things I want to say about sharks. But if you're bored, you will turn off the show. Right. And if I put too much information, which I call my expression for this is front loading. If I give you all the information at the beginning, then you're going to go, oh, this is the most boring thing in the right. world. And so the question is, is when do I do it? And so Ken Burns has purposely withhold, withheld the full bios of Grant and Lee until the moment that they are about to face each other in the field. Right. That is such a, and, and again, I know this was not something that came easily like they didn't just know this at the beginning they're going in when are we going to do it when are we going to do it and then they finally had the idea this is when we're going to do it yeah i mean that's just so and i know it sounds silly it's something i think about in the cinephiles all the time well construction is important yeah you do focus on it as well yeah why now at this point at after the halfway point of the documentary itself we're going to now go backwards and get this biography of both of these men from beginning to end and i think it makes sense because we're going to get these guys fighting over the next two to three episodes until the end. And so we want to now know more about these two people because they're the ones who stand out from the war of, of yeah. all the two generals. I mean, of all the generals, rather, these are the two of that course, are at the yeah. top of the yeah. of the thing. We Grant, by the way, I don't think we'd said last time is voiced by Jason Robards. Yeah, great, 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 great. Jason Robards. Yeah. And we hear, which I love is that when he enrolled at West Point, they someone accidentally stuck that S as a, he didn't have a middle name. Mm-hmm. And so he just kept it. He graduated in the middle of his class. He fought in the Mexican-American War and did well, was a good soldier. And then he started drinking and he tried farming, fail. Tried bill collecting, fail. Mm. Worked in a shop, fail. Finally goes back into the army. um, And that when he was, the soldiers didn't salute him. Yeah. Can you imagine? Here's the most powerful general in the Union Army. And he didn't expect soldiers to salute him. Well, he was one of them yeah. in that way because he came from a hard scrabble situation and found his way into this position of power. And the last thing he wanted to do was to put on airs. I think it's fascinating, too, to think about what they what they highlight here is that he was a reserve child. His father didn't know what to do with him. Yep. His father's the one who got him into got him the appointment to West, West Point. Point. And so he was probably on the spectrum. You could argue he was Mm. on the spectrum. A reserve child who only communicated and connected with horses. He didn't have a lot of communication with other people. Uh, he was he adored his wife, and when his wife wasn't around, that's when he turned to drink. Or when he was right. bored, that's when he turned to drink because his mind would start to play tricks on him or create things, scenarios, whatever. And so he drank to feel better or to do whatever. And he'd go on benders. For God's sakes, he would yeah. go on benders. Like serious, serious yeah. drinking. As a general. I love this line, and maybe this relates to you putting him on the spectrum, but I love this line that he, you know, he didn't like marching bands. He didn't like marching bands and could recognize only two tunes. One was Yankee Doodle, he said, and the other wasn't. <laughs> I just think that's pretty a, much. It's a damn funny line. And of course, in the South, they go, oh, yeah, Grant's been pretty good out there in the West, but he's never met Bobby Lee. Right. And then we go and find out about Bobby Lee. Anybody say they know the general? 
I doubted. He looked so cold, quiet, and grand. I think that Lee should have been hanged. It was all the worse that he was a good man and a fine character and acted conscientiously. It's always the good men who do the most harm in the world. Henry Adams. And it's the good men who do the worst things in the world. And it's true. Um, And this is something we're going to struggle with about him, you know, throughout this whole story. Um, and and he is the opposite story. Mm-hmm. He comes from an important family. His grandfather fought under George Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, he was the top of his class at West Point. He was extremely successful in the Mexican-American War. He was the country's most promising soldier, mm-hmm. refused command of the Union Army, didn't support slavery or se- secession, but chose it as his duty to Virginia, which we talked about before. Mm-hmm. And he says that there, he had no other course without dishonor. And... This idea of honor is something I think we're going to talk about quite a bit as we go through the second half of the Civil War. I did only what my duty demanded. I could have taken no other course without dishonor. The man who stood before us was the realized King Arthur. The soul that looked out of his eyes was as honest and fearless as when it first looked out on life. One saw the character as clear as crystal, without complication. He also had a horrible, horrible temper from what it says, and he had an icy stare. And you know people like that. Oh, yeah. You know, who who are very, like, you know, uh, very much believe in the rules, very much believe in the pop and circumstance of things. And when you violate them, the look that you get or the anger, yeah. So they both have their foibles here. And of course, he did like the flummer. He was elegantly dressed. He did have the sword. He did have the hat. He did have, he, of course, men saluted him. I mean, my God, you were in the presence of of Robert E. Lee, a terrifying, superior person. Early in the war, he was ridiculed as the king of spades because of his fondness for entrenching, and Granny Lee because of his gray hair and strict ways. But after he drove McClellan off the peninsula, stopped Pope at Second Manassas, demolished Burnside at Fredericksburg, and destroyed Hooker at Chancellorsville, all despite overwhelming odds, he won the unshakable confidence of Jefferson Davis and the unqualified love of his officers and men. He is a very great general. And uh, he, he's superb on both the offensive and the defensive. Uh, he took long chances, but he took them because he had to. If Grant had not had superior numbers, he might have taken chances as long as Lee took. That man Grant will fight us every day and every hour till the end of the war. General James Longstreet. And these are the two people that are going to go fight. The next section is called In the Wilderness. Um, and Grant comes at Grant as opposed to everybody else we've seen on the Union side. He has a plan, a four prong attack. Sherman is heading towards Atlanta. Meade is going after Lee. And we have, uh, I think Sheridan is in the Shenandoah Valley. We have, and he's like, the, all of these things are moving forward. We are going to attack. And Lee's strategy is to destroy Union resolve. And this goes into a very different kind of war, which is that he, he knows, essentially, he can't win a straight-up war against the Union Army at this point, particularly after Gettysburg. Right. And that what he is worried about is the election, is that if we can make it hurt, Lincoln won't get reelected, the Union will sue for peace, and then the war will be over. Right. Because the South doesn't have to defeat the, the North. That's not what the North has to defeat the South mm-hmm. in order to take back all those lines. The South just has to be left alone. Yeah. Um, and we end up at the Battle of the Wilderness. And this is a, a battle, it's a battlefield that's already been fought on and the, and the shallow graves have been washed up by the rain and as they come in, they can see the bodies. It grew dark and we built a fire. The dead were all around us. Their eyeless skulls seemed to stare steadily at us. The trees swayed and sighed gently in the soft wind. Private Frank Wilkerson. And this battle was total chaos. The Battle of the Wilderness began in chaos. Units got lost, fired on their own comrades. Officers tried to navigate by compass. On the second day, the Union actually breaks the Confederate line and Lee rallies the Texans. Scarce had we moved a step when General Lee, in front of the whole command, raised himself in his stirrups, uncovered his gray hairs, and with an earnest voice exclaimed, Texans always move them. 
Never before in my lifetime did I ever see such a scene as was enacted when Lee pronounced these words. A yell rent the air that must have been heard for miles around. A courier riding by my side with tears coursing down his cheeks exclaimed, I would charge hell itself for that old man. The Texans held the position until reinforcements came. And the Confederates almost co cut all the supply lines. I mean, it's almost a complete rout. Yeah. Um, and in all this, Grant is calm. Yeah. And people kept coming to him talking about Robert E. Lee. And he says, stop talking about Bo what Bobby Lee is going to do to us and start thinking about what we're going to do to him. Yeah. Yeah. This idea of breaking down the mythology of Robert E. Lee. Yep. It's really important. You know, as I get older and rewatch these, I start to find that I have an anger towards Lee that I never had when I was younger. Um, and I think it's because of the fact that people mythologize him so much and let him get away with the things he did because he was a good man or a nice man or he looked good in his suit. He still perpetrated a point of view that was pro-slavery. Yeah, you can do states' rights or whatever, but still pro-slavery. And that's important. And I think um, what Lee, what Grant says here is really important. If everyone was caught up with mythologizing Robert Lee, Lee, they would be overwhelmed before they even walked into right. the battle. And the thing is, you have to think you're equal or better to the person you're competing against, or you're going to be overwhelmed by that person the second it starts to go wrong yep. a little bit. And Shelby Foote has a great uh, uh, interview, or great to quote what he says. Um, Rob, uh, Grant had 4 a.m. courage. Yep. And what that means is you could wake him up at 4 a.m. and say his right flank. Is being overwhelmed, and he'd figure out what to do and be totally calm about it. Yeah. I envy those people. I really do. Uh, and I wish I had more of that. So when I hear him talk about it, it's just like, and that's why another thing why I think he's on the spectrum, because to him, things didn't affect yeah. him in the way they affected other people, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's as, a, as a director, that's an important skill to have. <laughs> yes. It sure um, is. Uh, well, it's funny what you, what you say. I totally agree. And I think, so there's a, there's a thing that Shelby Foote says, uh, and I think it was in an earlier episode, which is that... It was because we failed to do the thing we really have a genius for, which is compromise. Americans like to think of themselves as uncompromising. Our true genius is for compromise. Our whole government's founded on it, and it failed. I've been th When I was younger, I was just an idealist. I was mm -hmm. like, well, this is the right thing, and this is what you should do. Right. And more and more, I believe what Shelby Foote says about compromise is that is that Lincoln came to power as a compromise and said, let's compromise. Lincoln, as much as he abhorred slavery, said, we need to keep the Union together. And it is the uncompromising South that led to the Civil War. Right. And then the uncompromising more that we could say during Reconstruction and all of these other yeah. times. I'm not saying both sides have this way. And it's like, there's this point where, you know, being able to say like, we, if we can come to an agreement, we can move the country forward. Yeah. And if we're uncompromising, we won't. Um, and that's a hard compromise is hard, especially with Americans. Yeah. So we're in the battle of wilderness and it was so terrible. Some people describe it as the bloodiest battle of the war. And there were even times where there was huge fires in the woods and hundreds of soldiers, wounded soldiers died in the fires. And it, there was so much screaming and crying from the amputations and the wounded that Grant went out and out of his tent and sat under a tree and cried. Some of the staff members said they'd never seen a man so unstrung. But he didn't cry until the battle was over, and he wasn't crying when it began again next day. What was different about Grant became clear the next morning when he gave the order to march. For the first time after a defeat, the Army of the Potomac was moving forward. McClellan would have backed off. All the other generals would have blacked off. He's like, nope, we'll keep doing it. And one of the Union soldiers says, Ulysses don't scare worth a damn. <laughs> when uh, they fired, let's see, five or six generals before they got to Grant. And by the time they let McClellan go, Lee said, I'm afraid they're going to keep making these changes until they get someone I don't understand. <laughs> uh, they never got anyone he didn't understand. But uh, they finally got Grant, who knew how to whip him and did. It wasn't about the numbers. It wasn't, no. and people tried to default on that. Oh, Grant had more numbers, blah blah blah. I think Grant would have beat Lee even if the the things were reversed. If Grant was in charge of the, oh, I don't think so of the South. Um, I think he would have beaten Lee. No, I don't think so. Okay, I do think it's about the numbers. Okay. But I think that's what Grant knew that McClellan yeah. didn't. It's like 
They cannot sustain this battle. The mm -hmm. way to defeat them is to keep the battle going and keep coming at them. The thing I hold on to is what one of Lee's generals said is this man will come, keep coming after us and he won't stop. Yeah. And I think when you have a general in charge of you, of an army that does that, all bets are off in terms of numbers, in my opinion. I hear your opinion. I respect it. It's probably the majority opinion. I just think, I think Grant would have won. Either way, I think Grant would have won. I just have a belief mm. in that. The next battle, Spotsylvania, t Lee lost 20,000 more dead, including Jeb Stewart. So now he's lost his main... General Jeb Stewart, yeah. Lost his main cavalry commander. The next section is called Move by the Left Flank. And this is just about Grant continuing to outflank, trying to outflank Lee, continuing to fail, mm. and continuing to keep coming. Um, and the and the thing that Grant knows and that Lee knows too is that Grant can afford to lose men and Lee can't. Right, which is why he uses that strategy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Cold Harbor. Lee gets there first, gets dug in, and it is a mess. And yeah. Grant, the biggest regret of the war is the last final assault on Cold Harbor, which was a total failure. Grant lost a tremendous amount of men. Um, and that, seven thousand, I think. Oh my God! It's Too just entrenched. Soldiers. Yep. Well, this is the mistake that we see over and over again. Yep. And you Lee made it. Uh, you know, yes. uh, everyone has made this mistake, and it oh. takes a long time to go like, oh, we can't actually punch through entrenched positions in that kind of right. you know landscape. After the battle, the diary of a young Massachusetts volunteer was found spattered with blood. Its last entry read, June third, eighteen sixty four, Cold Harbor, Virginia. I was killed. And what's so amazing is that as you're hearing that, you're looking at a photograph of a dead Union soldier. Yeah. And of course, naturally we go, that's the Union soldier, right. which of course it's not, you know, it's just a photograph. But now they're linked together because of the filmmaking. Yeah. In, uh, in this month, the first month of Grant's command and his attacks on Lee, the Union lost 50,000 soldiers. It's half of what they lost in the previous three years. Yeah. And that's why Grant has this reputation as a butcher. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone in the South hates him. And people in the North are like, who is this guy we put in charge? Right. And Lee thought he handled himself well. The person, the general mm -hmm. most concerned with it said, I think Lee knows, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He finally, if someone yeah. finally understands how to use the overwhelming numbers. Yeah. Um, where, where Grant continues to move south and Lee thinks he's going to Richmond and actually he misread him mm -hmm. because uh, Grant, and again, this is brilliant Union soldiery, builds this pontoon bridge, moves thousands of men over this pontoon bridge to go after Petersburg. Yeah. And now we have the siege of Petersburg, which is going to last for 10 months. <laughs> That's insane yep. to think about. Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, one of the heroes of Gettysburg, led his regiment in an assault on Petersburg. As he turned to rally his men, a bullet smashed through his pelvis, severed arteries, nicked his bladder. He stayed on his feet, leaning on his sword with one hand and waving his men on with the other until they had all passed him by. Then he sank to the ground. Doctors did not expect him to live. In tribute to his courage, Grant promoted him on the field to Brigadier General. And his obituary appears all, you know, the hero of the Little Round Top appears yeah. all over the North because everyone just assumes he's going to die. Yeah. Which I feel like I've kind of... He kind of sold it. I kind of died. Yeah, I, I didn't... I didn't the, the movie actually does a better job of making you go, oh, no, he's died. <laughs> um, and we hear more about hospitals and we hear about Walt Whitman in the hospitals and Dorothea Dix, who is... One of the great mm -hmm. heroes of the war. Yeah. Stated her post four years running all the hospitals in the Union for free. For free. Um, Sherman's march to Atlanta. Yeah. And we hear a little bit more about the friendship between Sherman and Grant. And we have the great quote. Grant stood by me when I was crazy. And I stood by him when he was drunk. And now we stand by each other always. That's a great quote. Well, think about <laughs> this. Yeah, exactly. Well, think about this. You have a general who is possibly on the spectrum, who is a raging alcoholic only when he's not around his wife. You have an, another general, you could argue the second general in command, who is who has mental health issues and suicidal. Yeah, This is incredible. This is incredible to think about. 
And yet in 2019, we still have stigmas. It's massively, in, like, I think it's important to, to, to highlight this. These are not two perfect men who were able to achieve this victory. And even Lincoln was prone to his own things as well. These are men who have this within them because when you take on the pressure of an entire nation to save an entire nation, what what must that do to you inside? You know, what? how overwhelming that must be at times. Well, and I'll put it a different way. People are not perfect. Yeah. And I think I think the thing, and, and, and in particular, people that do great things, yeah. normal people frequently don't do those things because normal people go, eh. Yeah. You know? <laughs> or go, that's uh, no, it's that's too a little hard. overwhelming. It's yeah. too hard. How it's am I going to do it? It's only like, you know, we hear about Grant that, you know, he rarely slept. He constantly yeah. talked. He was intense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, you know, whether or not he was bipolar or what, but it sounds kind of like that kind of yeah. thing is that once he was going, he never stopped. Yeah. I'm sorry, Sherman. I think I said Sherman. Right. Yeah, Sherman. Sherman. Um, like the, the, and this, you know, you look at, at Lincoln and all these people is, I think the thing we're struggling with today is that we used to put all these leaders up on a pedestal. Right. Right. And say, oh, our leaders are perfect people. And then as we've discovered, particularly in the last 50 years, how flawed all these people are. Yeah. Kennedy, FDR, you know, all these people, like, we, we go, okay, well, we wouldn't accept that today. Right. And, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but like, I think we're really struggling <laughs> with allowing our leaders to be human. Yeah. And accepting the fact that sometimes the things that make them a little bit crazy are the things that make them great. Exactly. Sherman was an orphan and had graduated sixth in his class at West Point when he was only 20. He wore shoes rather than military boots, slept little and talked a lot, boiling over with ideas, a friend said. He was ruthless in war. Now Grant entrusted his friend with the second most important part of his grand strategy, to seize Atlanta and smash the combined Confederate armies of Tennessee and Mississippi under Joseph E. Johnston. And Johnson just hoped that he could slow him down again in time for the election. Just slow Sherman down. Yeah. And Sherman's advance, unsurprisingly, is extremely well planned yeah. and well executed. And I didn't know who was voicing General Sherman. Did you know? Uh, no, I, I think I knew, but it, who I had no idea. Arthur Miller. Right. The playwright, yep. Arthur Miller, and his voice is fantastic. It's all scra hard scrabble, yep. and it fits the face so perfectly. Um, there's a moment where they collapse the tunnel in Sherman's rear, rear, essentially cutting off the supply lines. And one of the Confederate soldiers was not impressed. He says, Sher Sherman probably carries a spare <laughs> <laughs> because that's how he traveled. Yeah. And this is the thing, again, this is modern warfare is it's not just the guy fighting the, in the front lines. It is engineers, logistics, right. organizations, supply lines, communications. And this is where Sherman is a modern general. Yep. Uh, there's a battle at Kennesaw Mountain, which uh, Sherman does never, he messes it up, again, attacking in a trench position. And what they say about him is he never admitted he made a mistake, but he never repeated it. Because mm -hmm. Sherman learns. Slowly, relentlessly, he forced Johnston out of Dalton. Risaka. Cassville. Alatoona. New Hope Church. A surrendering Confederate told his captors, Sherman will never go to hell. He'll flank the devil and make heaven in spite of the guards. And then he gets to Atlanta and he's stalled there. And we have the siege of Atlanta and the siege of Petersburg. Yeah. And of course, Lincoln needs a victory for the election. Yeah. Um, and we've reached episode seven. And we hear how unpopular the war has become, particularly in the North. Yeah. And that Lincoln is going to do this crazy thing, which is to hold a national election in the middle of a civil war. First of all, obviously, this has never happened in the world. Right, right. And the idea, this would be a perfect time for someone to say, nope, we're going to suspend elections. We got to get through this crisis. Right. And the, the, this is where the, the heroism and the importance of Lincoln you know, is principles. the principles of Lincoln. The American principles yeah. of Lincoln. It, it, you know, the first exa great example of this is Washington choosing not to run for a third term. Yeah. Is that him choosing to step down and say, no, because we, we, we've never had this. Mm -hmm. No leader of a country has ever stepped down. Right. We have to show that the institution is what's important. It's more, and everyone's like, well, yeah, but your enemies, your rivals, people you don't agree with could win. He's like, yeah. 
(laughs) That's what democracy is. That's the first example. Lincoln choosing to run for re-election in the midst of the Civil War, knowing how unpopular he is, knowing that the odds are that a Democrat will be elected who will end the war, putting slaves back in slavery and the great tragedy of that, and yet still saying... Again, this is this is that idea of compromise. Like, like, no, I believe in the principles more than, yeah. That's amazing. We cannot have free government without elections. And if the rebellion could force us to forego or postpone a national election, it might fairly be claimed to have already conquered and ruined us. And who he ends up going up against is great, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the people are wild for peace, a newspaper reported. Lincoln's re-election is an impossibility. And we're in, we kind of describe this moment. Grant and Sherman are stopped. Nathan Bedford Forrest has become the most terrifying cavalry commander of the war. Mm. And there's this line that, as the opening ends of, uh, we couldn't remember a time without war, and many believed it would never end. And we, the title of this episode is 1864, Most Hallowed Ground. Mm. And we get to a section title, A Warm Place in the Field, and we have the Siege of Petersburg, and Lee is continually like sending troops out into the north to try to reduce the pressure on Petersburg. And we hear a lot about Nathan Bedford Forrest and what he does uh, against Sherman's army. Yeah. And he's, a, you know, like this is the, the I, I think, the archetypal bad guy yeah. in, term, in, in the war. But he's also an impressive man. Forrest, William Tecumseh Sherman later said, was the most remarkable man our Civil War produced on either side. He was the son of an illiterate blacksmith. He made himself a millionaire selling land, cotton, and slaves. In 1861, he enlisted as a private, then quit to raise and equip an entire cavalry battalion out of his own pocket. By the end of the war, he had become lieutenant general the only man on either side to rise so far. He was shot many times. He had 30 horses shot out from under him. He killed 31 men in hand-to-hand combat. He went against Sherman, who had three times the men, and he was a terror, Mm -hmm. an absolute terror. And he continually slowed Sherman's march, and he is also the founder of the KKK. Right. You know, the first Grand Wizard or whatever the names are. Yeah, the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. So, you know, there you go. There you go. Um, Well, it's this thing that I said, I think, in the last episode is that I think we want to believe that the people on the other side of the political divide Mm -hmm. or who have belief systems that we don't like must therefore be dishonorable, uncourageous, and incompetent. Right, right. And that is not the case. Nope. You know? And and, and I think our our natural biases tend to point out the flaws in the other side and Mm -hmm. blind ourselves to the flaws on our own side. Right. And point out the successes on our side and blind ourselves to the successes or positive qualities on the other side. And that's not actually reality. Yeah. Reality is that he, whatever we can say about him, is that he was clearly a brave and brilliant man. In June 1864, in an attempt to cut off Sherman's supplies at Bryce's Crossroads near Tupelo, Mississippi, Forrest outdid even himself. The Union Army coming to stop him was nearly three times as strong as his, but Forrest was unimpressed. Factoring in the mud-clogged roads and the blazing mid-June sun, he predicted the Union cavalry would arrive well ahead of the Union infantry, giving him time to whip it on his own terms. It all happened exactly as he said. Um, yeah, but I don't think we should have statues of him all over the country. I do not think so either. Yeah. Um, when you lose a war, you lose yeah. a war. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Just uh, say. Yeah. Um, summer 1864 and Grant continues to have appalling lo- losses. And we talk more about the election and Lincoln doesn't think he's going to get reelected. And who is, you, you hinted at it before, who is going to be running against, uh, Lincoln? Oh, George McClellan. He is the Democratic nominee. And this is an ugly campaign yeah. with plenty of racial overtones. Uh, there's huge pressure to end emancipation. And Lincoln, you know, it's like, look, em- end emancipation, you might get reelected. And Lincoln said, no. I should be damned in time and in eternity if I were to return to slavery the black warriors who have fought for the Union. Even uh, when he could, he doesn't. Yeah. 
you know, he's a man of principles. Uh, we hear a little bit about spies, and I always love that this is that Alan Pinkerton is the beginning of the Secret Service, yeah. and that's Pinkertons. Yeah. That's like the big detective agency in the West. You know, does yeah. it still exist, the Pinkertons? I think so. Yeah, in some form, I do think it does exist. Maybe they should sponsor the Cinephiles. <laughs> I don't know if we want Pinkerton. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Their history's not an unspotted history. Of the spies, there are lots of women, uh, f- including uh, slaves and former slaves, one of which worked inside the Confederate White House. And, and there's a story where one spy who was caught was so moving at his speech, at his execution, that the general couldn't give the order, and the spy gave the order for his own hanging. Wow. Yeah. The next section is the crater. This story is so sad, which is that they come up with the idea, I think it was Burnside's idea, mm-hmm. to dig a tunnel under the uh, the defenses at Petersburg, explode a huge bomb, and then march through and take the town. Right. And it sounds like it could have worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, I couldn't find it. There was some podcast I listened to that did a whole piece in detail on this, and oh, it wow. is so terrible. Okay. And like the, the guy whose idea it was ended up, they relieved him of command. They put someone else in command. It was terribly executed. Mm-hmm. They built, they literally did build this huge tunnel. It did go all the way under the Petersburg defenses. And then the timing of when they were going to blow it was off. And of course, they also decided, let's send, instead of sending our white troops in, let's yeah. send all the black troops in. Right. So they ended up all getting blown up. And then, but they actually did blow through the defenses. Yeah. But then rather than going in on the rim... They all went in on the bottom. Yeah. They didn't have ladders. And the South, who they could have taken Petersburg easily after yep. this. And the South saw this huge group of men come in through this tunnel and they just stood on top and killed them all. Yeah. Yeah. No ladders. I don't understand the logic of that. Well, I mean, well, you served in the military. Yeah. How often were you in a situation that was FUBAR? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a few times depends on the pro who's in charge. It yeah. always depends on who's in charge. It's all about the. Yeah. It's and even if you have a great general, if the if the major and the captain and particularly that second lieutenant, yeah, is an idiot, yeah, you're still gonna walk in without ladders. That's why I could never. This is why I could only rise up so far because my mouth would get the best of me <laughs> and say this. Uh, this is stupid. What you guys were thinking about doing? And they go, okay, corporal. Okay. I mean, private <laughs> specialist. <laughs> <laughs> A sergeant who used to be a specialist or a specialist who used to be a sergeant. Yeah. Um, Grant describes that as the saddest thing he ever witnessed in the war. Yeah. Our next title is called Headquarters USA, and we hear about all the boxing matches, baseball games, yeah. cockfights, louse races, which I just think is hilarious. Card playing, and of course, brothels. We hear about Admiral Farragut, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, and how he wiped out the rebel fleet along the Mississippi. And that's the first good news of the year. Yeah. And now Sherman's made it to Atlanta. Um, and strangely enough, here's Joe Johnson, who's the general in charge of the troops at Atlanta and who's beloved by his men and a very strong general. And Jefferson Davis relieves him of, of command and puts John Bell Hood back in charge. This is a dude that lost one arm one place, lost a leg somewhere else, yeah. had another arm shot that he couldn't use. They drag him around on a cart and his his main idea is just attack him with everything. <laughs> And it does not go well, and and Sherman just beats the hell out of Hood. Well, and that's the thing. Just because you push forward and you have, you know, just because you push forward doesn't mean. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? You got to know how to push forward. Of course. And this guy just does, does not. Sherman was delighted with Hood, sure he would be attacked at last. Many of his units were now armed with Henry repeating rifles, capable of firing 15 shots without being reloaded. Outgunned rebels complained the Yankees could now load on a Sunday and keep shooting all week. It's a beautiful moment where we hear about this cornet player on the southern side all right. and that the armies just stop to listen to this guy play. That It reminds me of the soccer, famous soccer game mm-hmm. in the between the trenches in World War I. Yeah. August 31st of 1864, Sherman defeats Hood just south of Atlanta. On September 1st, Hood abandons Atlanta and Sherman marches in. Grant orders a 100-gun salute fired into the Confederate forces at Petersburg. The next section is the age of shoddy. And we hear about all the manufacturing and all the essentially war profiteers building crap. Uh, to you know, shoes that don't stay together, yep. uh, bullets that don't fire, weapons that don't work clothes that fall apart what a shock that there are people willing to make money at the expense of 
people of lower classes fighting for a cause. It's not a surprise. And those people are the ones who deserve to go to hell straight up. I wish the term war should be executed. I wish the term war profiteer existed today. It was a, if you were named a war profiteer during World War II, yeah. it was a big deal. Yeah. That was, you were a terrible, awful person. How dare you make a profit right. off of the lives of young young men going to yeah. war? Yeah. We have half, big portion, big portion of our industry are war profiteers. Right. As long as you make quality products, that's what matters. If you make shoddy products knowingly, that's disgusting. I actually don't agree. Okay. Um, I think... I think, yes, absolutely, you should make quality products. Mm -hmm. But I also think if your bottom line is I need wars to continue and ah. you're making massive profits. Agreed. Ag massive, massive profits. Yes, yes, that yes. is not ethical. Right. You Agreed. know, Agreed. particularly if you're lobbying the government to have these huge military contracts yeah. and then and then cr help pushing for uh, tensions within, I don't know, places like Iran. Iran. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Our next section is called Could These Be Men? And we start to hear about prisoners. And we start to hear about pr prisoner exchanges. Uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest took a, f uh, a fortress and killed all the black soldiers there after they surrendered. More than 300 people he executed because they were black soldiers, which in his mind meant that they were subhuman and they were traitors and therefore should be executed. At that moment, Grant stopped doing any prisoner exchanges until they treated African-American soldiers the same. Yeah, it It's funny, reading that Chernow book on Grant, he was so, uh, what we would term today, progressive yeah. about civil rights, and that was part of what messed up his presidency, mm -hmm. you know, because he's fighting with the radical Republicans and fight, because he wants to have more of a Lincoln-esque uh, relationship to the South after the war, but also maintain civil rights, which is this really, really difficult road to yeah. walk, and he w got attacked from both sides, mm -hmm. from the radical Republicans for not being harsh enough on the South, um, and from the south for being for pushing for civil rights yeah andersonville one of the hardest sections in the film yeah um it was a prison in georgia supposed to hold ten thousand people it hold thirty three thousand. yeah became the fifth largest city in the confederacy uh they forbade prisoners to build shelters they lived in holes in the ground rations were tiny there there was a little creek that was both their drinking water and their sewer one third of the original enclosure was swampy a mud of liquid filth, voiding from the thousands, seething with maggots and full activity. Death at the hands of the guards, though murder in cold blood, was merciful besides a systematic, studied, absolute murder inside by slow death. In one year, 13,000 people died at Andersonville, and they were buried in mass graves. Mm -hmm. Interesting what happens when you don't adequately provide shelter and living conditions sanitary sanitary conditions for people to live in interesting what can happen and how many people can die and how many people turn a blind eye to it yep yep and don't hold anyone accountable for it and just go on living their lives like it's no big deal well there is a certain in my mind way that you treat humans yeah even humans who are on death row for terrible crimes right which have been proven in a court there's still a way, a basic way, not because of them, but because of us. Yes, exactly. And and you can't abandon your religion or abandon your principles or your morals in those moments. In fact, that's when you should be showing them what you're really made of is in those moments, what you really believe yep. in those moments, because it's not in the easy moments when it's easy to do it. It's in the tougher moments when it's easy to stay, stay hard to stand by them and stick by them. Yeah. Well, and the first step is to label somebody as other. Right. So these are the these are the unions. Or lesser. Yeah, or lesser. Yeah. These are the union scumbags who have attacked us. Right. Therefore, I can treat them however I want. Exactly. You know, Lincoln refused to put the slaves back into slavery because of his principles. Yeah. He was willing to lose an election because of his principles. Right. And this is where, uh, it's funny, just a few minutes ago, I, I was arguing for compromise. Yeah. And now I'm here I am on the other side. Well, there are certain things you compromise on. Basic humanity, I don't think, is something don't you need so to either. be compromising on. I, and we see what happens, and we'll get to it later, but we'll see what happens with the, when the South does near the end of the war, when they know they're going to lose, what desperate thing they do uh, that really shows you how flaccid their morals and principles were in this battle. And they show pictures of the soldiers from Andersonville. And, of course, the first thing that goes into my mind is the pictures of Jews at Auschwitz. You know, it's the same malnourished, barely 
alive skeletons, yeah. living skeletons. Can those be men? Are they not really corpses? They lay there, most of them, quite still, but with a horrible look in their eyes. The dead there are not to be pitied as much as some of the living that have come from there, if they can be called living. Walt Whitman. My heart aches for these poor wretches, Yankees though they are, and I am afraid God will suffer some terrible retribution to fall upon us for letting such things happen. If the Yankees should ever come to southwest Georgia and go to Anderson and see the graves there, God have mercy on the land. Yeah. One story there that's just about filmmaking. So there's, in addition to the beautiful photographs, there's the beautiful film that was actually shot at the battlefields and mm. in, in the, you know, on the rivers and seeing the trees and seeing the landscape. Uh, and largely this was shot at Magic Hour. And Magic Hour mm. is that time just before and just after dawn and just before and just after uh, sunset mm. where the light is just beautiful. It takes on that warm, glowing, high contrast quality. Yeah. So they show up at Andersonville and they want to film the cemetery. And there's a national monument there. And the dude there says, okay, we open at eight o'clock. And they say, listen, we need to get in at five o'clock because the sun rises at six. And so we need that time to get set up. And the guy says, we open at eight o'clock. <laughs> and they say that we understand that. But if you could just have someone like, just let us in, we'll come in. We're not going to bother anybody. Yeah. We're just going to come in. We're going we're we'll to be, be done before you we're gonna be done before you even open. Yeah. And please, this is really important. And as you know, that we really want to portray the story of Andersonville, which is your you know, place. And the guy says, we open at eight o'clock. <laughs> and so they get up at four 30, they go to the fence outside. They climb the fence with all their equipment. They break into Andersonville, film all the, those gravestones during sunrise. Oh my God. And go back out, climb back over the fence and show back up at eight o'clock and say, Hey, we're here to film. And they film a couple other things. <laughs> So even Ken Burns <laughs> will break and enter. He flanked, he flanked. He yep. flanked that situation yep. perfectly. How did that have security in that place? Incredible. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I've broken into some places to film some stuff. I mean, I filmed on the Universal back lot without permission. So <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't do it today. Oh, it's tougher. Today. Um, and now Lincoln's chances are improving. Um, Phil Sheridan is fighting through the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and his instructions, which is what we're going to hear from Sherman, is to strip the land totally clean. Um, there's one story of Sheridan, who's this, you know, fascinating cavalry commander, where his men are attacked. He's 20 miles away. He gallops or rides fast with a whole bunch of men 20 miles to show up to save the day. Sheridan mounted his great black horse, Rienzi, and galloped through his retreating men, urging them to turn back. They stopped and began to chant his name. God damn you, Sheridan shouted, don't cheer me, fight. The Union lines reformed and won back the field. Early fled, and the Shenandoah was closed forever to the Confederacy. General Sheridan, when this particular war began, I thought a cavalryman should be at least six foot four inches high, but I have changed my mind. Five feet four will do in a pinch. Abraham Lincoln. Again, Grant fires a 100-gun salute into uh, Petersburg. Um, and as this is happening, Lincoln, surprisingly, not only wins the election, but has a huge universal majority. Yeah. And McClellan's old command voted for Lincoln, mm. even though they loved him. Yep. Dear Nat, I think well of the president. He has a face like a Hoosier Michelangelo, so awful ugly it becomes beautiful with its strange mouth, its deep cut crisscross lines and its donut complexion. I do not dwell on the supposed failures of his government. He has shown an almost supernatural tact in keeping the ship afloat at all. I more and more rely upon his idiomatic Western genius. Walt Whitman. And uh, that's that's the end for the South, really, is Lincoln winning that election means the South is doomed. And this is and this is this thing they start talking about. And it's a thing that I I need to learn more about this term. 
is the idea of the lost cause. Mm. The idea of um, the South, this legend of the lost, that it was always doomed. And that it wasn't, and, and this is the reframing of the Civil War is not about slavery, but about states' rights and the, the, the desire of the North to destroy the Southern way of life. And that that idea has gone through Southern history for about 100 years. Yeah. And, and it's something that... It's still around. That's still around. Having grown up in the South, I can tell you it is something that is said in whispers. It's also said in moments of braggadocio that there is this belief still, and from generation to generation to generation has passed on, that the North uh, abhors the South, wants to destroy the South, and it's and they're the victims in this, in this American situation. Yep. And it's been constant. From the birth of this country, since 1776... To now, it is still a, an inherent thing, and I think it really is now even more so. The last two years or three years has really popped up. Um, oh shit! I'd probably say over the last eleven years, it's really shown itself uh, as a very stark division um, and tribalism. Now we almost seem to be marching backwards uh, into a situation that we are talking about in this documentary or about this documentary. It seems to me it goes in waves, how united we feel as a country and how divided, right? You know, and and it's interesting to watch and it's much too broad a a topic for this podcast, but is the, the transition from, you know, because the, the South were Democrats, essentially, yeah, yeah. from the end of the Civil War until starting in the 40s with the Dixiecrats, yeah. is that the transition of the South going from Democrats, traditionally Democrats, to traditionally Republicans, and how that happened, and what movements, what changes within the Democratic Party and changes within the Republican Party led to that, yeah. you know, and, and, and yet how this narrative that you're describing of the separation... And I think both you and I love the South. Absolutely. I, I grew up in the I go back all the time. I love the South. I love the people in the South. I enjoy speaking with people in the South because I also absolutely. think the South has... the food and the culture and Sure. The, yeah, I think the South has a real gr- grounded nature to them that isn't full of frills and all that kind of jazz. And it's a good balance. The North has a little more of the need to be seen, the need to draw attention. And I think we're a good balance as a country for that. And I think that's what I wish we'd come to more understanding and compromise and connection because the better, well, as Lincoln would say, the better angels of our nature on each side could actually get along to create an even stronger country. But sadly, the division is what sells. Division is what makes money. Division is what uh, creates uh, uh, coffers. And so that's what, sadly, is what's happening. And if you compromise, you're somehow seen as weak, which right. is terrible. Yep. Uh, Lincoln declares a national day of Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. And the Confederate Army honors it by not firing over the Thanksgiving. And that, of course, is the Thanksgiving we have today. I think that's Robert E. Lee, too, going, yes, no one will fire. Yep. Of course, I, I 100%. I have no evidence of that, but I'm sure that you're right. Yeah. Um, and we also hear about these Booth brothers doing a production of Julius Caesar uh, in New York. Three brothers had the starring roles, Edwin, Junius, and John Wilkes Booth. At one point in Shakespeare's play, Cassius speaks of the assassination of Caesar. How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over, in states unborn and accents yet unknown? So my good friend, your friend too, Soren Oliver, Mm. has been writing a play about the Booth brothers and that production of uh, Julius Caesar. Wow. Yeah, he is, as as you know, one of the most meticulous researchers in the world. He has become such an expert on the booths and this wow. error. Really? Yeah. I still haven't read it. I mean, he's he's been working on it for a while. Um, I'm sure it'll be brilliant, yeah. as, as everything he does is. Um, and then we hear about the kind of the names of the dead, and we hear about cemeteries, and all these cemeteries are overloaded, and we're going to need to create a national cemetery. Mm. And uh, there's a general named Meggs, who was a Georgian, but stayed with the Union. Without hesitation, he picked the grounds of Robert E. Lee's home at Arlington for the new Army Cemetery, and ordered that the Union dead be laid to rest within a few feet of the front door of the man he blamed for their deaths, so that no one could ever again live in the house. In October, Meg's own son, John, was killed by Confederate guerrillas in the Shenandoah and buried in Mrs. Lee's Rose Garden. That is, that is such a, 
was kind of spiteful. That's what we call shade <laughs> yeah, nowadays. Yeah, just throwing some serious shade. <laughs> um, and, you know, Arlington is a beautiful place. Yes, it, it is. It's a profound, profoundly moving place. I have a really hard time going there. I can only go, I've only been there twice. It's overwhelming. At one point that year, the Union Army was sending back 2,000 wounded, maimed, and dying men a week to Washington. Now the men Grant was sending to fight Robert E. Lee were being buried in Lee's own front yard. And that yard became Arlington National Cemetery, the Union's most hallowed ground. by the way uh that they actually know who the unknown soldier from vietnam is oh really oh okay. yeah because with and there will never be another unknown soldier probably because with genetic testing and that just doesn't right and so they, they actually knew about who he was like 20 years ago oh wow um and then there was this thing of like well do we keep him there it's kind of it, it, symbolism of it yeah and the family's like no we we want him back like yeah. you know it's a really strange situation hi everyone this is steve jumping in for a quick promo for our latest sponsor, CNN. <laughs> That's right, CNN is sponsoring the Cinephiles because Sunday, July 7th, their new CNN original series, The Movies, premieres. Every week, the show will focus on a specific era of American film, from the golden age all the way to today. And they're kicking things off with the 80s and some Cinephiles favorites like The Breakfast Club, Back to the Future, and The Terminator. The series is produced by Tom Hanks and Gary Gertzman in association with HBO. Now, personally, I can't wait to see what they do with the golden age of Hollywood, big musicals, the rise of the auteur filmmakers of the 70s, and independent directors in the 90s. So, that's CNN's new original series, The Movies, starting Sunday, July 7th at 9. Now, it sounds like a must-see for all cinephiles. Okay, time to get back to The Civil War by Ken Burns. We believed that it was most desirable that the North should win. We believed in the principle that the Union is indissoluble. We, or many of us at least, also believed that the conflict was inevitable and that slavery had lasted long enough. But we equally believed that those who stood against us held just as sacred convictions that were the opposite of ours and we respected them as every man with a heart must respect those who give all for their belief. Oliver Wendell Holmes. And again, we see the film, real film of the veterans of the Civil War mm -hmm. with sound of them introducing themselves. Now you're hearing their voices. We are the veterans of the Civil War, 61 to 65. So you've been coming to know these guys for so long and now you're actually hearing the soldiers of the Civil War speak. And this, this episode is called 1865, War is Hell, which of course is a quote from General Sherman. Yeah. My aim was to whip the rebels, to humble their pride, to follow them to their innermost recesses and to make them fear and dread us. War is cruelty. There's no use trying to reform it. The crueler it is, the sooner it'll be over. William Tecumseh Sherman. And of course, Sherman knew about this from the beginning. And this idea, I don't know how to express this. Sherman is the first modern general and Sherman's march to the sea. And what that means in terms of the future of war, it's not that I don't think Sherman's right, mm -hmm. but I don't like it, you know, because. Yeah, you and I are different on this because I do like it. I do like what he did. I think he, but go ahead, Steve, you, I caught you off, go ahead. Well, I don't like it. It's not just what he did. It's that this is what war is. Mm -hmm. and it's oh, that's fair. You know, and it, the and overall concept, yeah. Well, and it's because, you know, this idea of total war, mm -hmm. because, and it's because of the movement towards industrial war. It's like it used to, when, when, when Napoleon's army or uh, Wellington's army was in the field, they lived by forage, which means wherever they went, they uh, took what was there. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of reasons that was terrible. And they also did terrible things, particularly to the women as they went into a new place, yeah. which is why Wellington called his soldiers the scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I think he also said they're the scum of the earth, but they're also the best army in the world or something like that. Um, but once you go into a mechanized uh, supply line, railroad based war, yeah. then the factory and the farm behind the lines becomes an agent within the war. And so therefore, rather than attack the soldiers in front, you destroy their means of making war, which is the supply lines, the factory, and the people supporting the war. And that's what modern war is. You know, there's a reason why, you know, the bombings of London or the bombings of Dresden or, you know, atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki mm -hmm. are not attacking the soldiers. All those things are attacking the will and the means to create war. And that's what modern war is. And people got so mad at me. Look okay, at And. No, that's it. I know what they got mad at you about. You do? Yeah. Uh, Game of Thrones. Yes. People got so mad at me because I was like, she performed a modern warfare No, uh, No, she didn't. Decision. No, I totally disagree to with you. To her, yeah. destroying the people in that moment, if she hadn't gone, you know, what people claim that she went insane, uh, if Daenerys had just done that and said, I wanted to destroy the will of the people once and for all, and we will build a new government, a new world uh, on their ashes that will not remember this moment. And we will build a com a world that accepts people for who they are. Because the general point of her was to destroy all slavery. That was the general point of what she was. And so, yes, in that moment, did she let the... Yes, but it was no different than dropping Nagasaki or anything else. It is different. Okay. So, so I, we're, we're, uh, we won't go into... In the, yeah. Because literally... We could do a we could do a lot on Game of Thrones. It might not be a bad Patreon thing to have a discussion, but yeah. Um, but ahead. but uh, she had already won. The war was over. Mm -hmm. There was no need to do it. It was unnecessary. Okay. You know, if 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 they had established that there was some way in which Cersei, who sat in a tower and drank wine through and did nothing interesting right. and, or intelligent in that episode at yeah, all, yeah, agreed, had some such brilliant a plan, yeah. and there was no way to defeat her other than doing the horrible thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that uh, Truman believed that the Japanese would never surrender. Yeah. And therefore, the only way was this massive demonstration of strength Right, uh, was the only way to force them to surrender. That's not what happens in Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. It's not even Sherman's March to the Sea. I mean, Sherman's March to the Sea, the Lee right. is... Right, the is, war was still happening. The war is still right in the, right. you know, and, 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 and Grant is having huge losses. Before leaving Atlanta, Sherman ordered all townspeople, white and black, out of their homes then directed his men to burn or destroy anything of use to the rebels. Civilians looted the town and helped spread the blaze throughout the city. A grand and awful spectacle is presented to the beholder in this beautiful city, now in flames. The heaven is one expanse of lurid fire. The air is filled with flying cinders. The city which, next to Richmond, has furnished more material for prosecuting the war than any other in the South, exists no more as a means for injury to be used by the enemies of the Union. Have you read um, Sherman's March? Yes. Um, they're not fighting battles, really. No, no. They're, they're just going through the countryside. They, you know, the soldiers describe it as a, the good life. This is probably the most gigantic pleasure excursion ever planned. It already beats everything I ever saw soldiering and promises to prove much richer yet. We had a gay old campaign. Destroyed all we could not eat, burned their cotton and gin, spilled their sorghum, burned and twisted their railroads and raised hell, generally. Sherman's men tore up railroads, heating the rails and twisting them beyond repair. It became a trademark, Sherman's neckties. He forbade his men to plunder the homes they passed, but neither he nor they took the order very seriously. And really, and if you look, read Sherman's March, there are times, particularly as they're heading up to South Carolina after Savannah, that he really lost control of the army. Mm -hmm. He just didn't have control, and they were doing a lot of stuff that's pretty. And this is so. And this goes to to your earlier point. Yeah, is was it necessary to win the war? Maybe it was. Is Sherman's march to the sea and his march up through South Carolina part of the deep resentment the South has had for the North for hundreds of years? Sure. Probably is. You know, right. and so then how do we balance, you know, is there a way to win the war without doing this? And of course, maybe if Lincoln had lived, mm -hmm. he might have found a way to renew those bonds and heal some of those wounds. 
I don't know. Maybe. But I don't know. I, I, people have been trying, uh, presidents have been trying to do that for years and still the South holds on to those grudges. Or some people, some people in the South hold yeah. on to those grudges. Um, okay, so you could argue this. Did Sherman do the right thing? In the long run, I feel like he did because it ended up showing you the resolve of the Union once and for all. Um, did he lose control of the army? Yeah, and that's the ugly truth of it because once you start to let them uh, release their baser instincts, yeah. it's really hard to corral it again. Yep. Well, and this is and anyone who goes like, our troops are good people and will never do bad things. Yeah. And their troops are bad people and will always do bad things. History just doesn't bear that out. Yep. You know, is that under certain circumstances, all I'm not saying all people, but there will be troops within yes. the military that will make decisions that are ones that we would be ashamed of. Absolutely. And let me say this because I don't, and people can get mad if they wanted me. I served for eight years, so I have a right to have an opinion about this. A majority of people who get into the service are from what class? The lower class, right? Who are historically less educated, less uh, uh, options for financial uh, stability and advancement. And so in those moments, they don't have that level of understanding of morals and principles. There are people, rather, that don't have that uh, base understanding of morals and principles. I experienced it numerous times when I was in for the eight years that I was in. And it's an ugly truth that people don't want to talk about too much. But it's the truth. And unfortunately, that's in moments like this or in war like this. And we've seen this even modern war now. Those things that happen in, in, in those prisons and the pictures and all that. Yeah. We give in to our baser instincts because we think we can. And we have a modicum of power, which we haven't had our entire lives. I, I, I'm going to I, I disagree with nothing that you said. But I'm going to make the opposite point as well, which is that is that it's not just about class because people who are of the rarefied, wealthier, more highly educated classes are also people frequently far more disconnected from the plights true. of the lower classes. Very true. And if you look at like, for instance, I don't know his whole biography, but the uh, the c commandant of Andersonville yeah. was not a lower class dude. Right. He was an officer and a gentleman. And he believed that these people were lesser than yeah. and therefore could be treated as you want. I mean, throughout history, yeah. you see, and or just think of the big plantation owners throughout the South. Yeah. Those are deep deeply educated people, you know, of the upper classes with strong senses of personal morality and honor who were uh, regularly raping their yeah. slaves and beating them to death. You know, like, I mean, the, the, is that humans of all classes have the ability to do these terrible, terrible things. It comes to the bill. It comes from the desire for power, right? In your position of power, do you abuse that position of power? Well, and, and, you know, it's like the 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 need to go meet the people on the other side and see them as human mm -hmm. will start there. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. as soon as you stop doing that, we're in trouble. Yep. The troops looted slave cabins as well as mansions, poked their ramrods into flower beds in search of buried valuables, and burned everything in their path. The thousand pounds of meat in my smokehouse is gone. My 18 fat turkeys, my hens, chickens and fowl, my young pigs are shot down in my yard as if they were the rebels. The cruelties practiced on this campaign towards the citizens have been enough to blast a more sacred cause than ours. We hardly deserve success. At this point, the Confederacy is generally starting to break up. Mm -hmm. Hood goes up north and just gets uh, wiped out by uh, General Thomas, who's known as the Rock of Chickamauga, which is, by the way, that's <laughs> one of the cool nicknames. That's a good handle to walk around with. Yeah. And and, and then we have this quote from Sherman. We cannot change the hearts of the people in the South, but we can make war so terrible that generations will come before they appeal to it again. And generations have. Yeah. And then we also hear that that one of the other things that Sherman's troops are doing is everywhere they go, they're freeing the slaves and the mm -hmm. slaves are coming with them. Yeah. Um, and we hear the voice of a slave freed by Sherman. And the Yankees had come, and after a while, there'd be a whole troop of men come. They said they were Yankees, all riding horses. So I asked them, I said, where are they going? They said, they're all going home now. They said, well, all of you niggas is all free now. And then the army disappeared. No one knew where they were until they reappeared in Savannah and began their nor march north to South Carolina. Yeah. 
And th there was a quote, which is, here is where treason began, and by God, this is where it should end. A relentless winter rain was falling, and Confederate generals were confident no army could march through the mud. But Sherman and his men made a steady 10 miles a day. Battalions of axemen led the way, hacking down whole forests to construct corduroy roads. When I learned that Sherman's army was marching through the Salkahatchee swamps, making its own roads at the rate of a dozen miles a day and bringing its artillery and wagons with it, I made up my mind that there had been no such army in existence since the days of Julius Caesar, Joseph E. Johnston. Few houses in South Carolina were left standing. Yeah. Uh, they retake Fort Sumter and, and uh, Charleston. And now we're seeing the photographs of the destruction. And it is terrifying. Total. Total destruction. It reminds me of seeing like Dresden after World War II. You know, just a complete wreck of a city. Yeah. Died of a theory is our next title. The Union is close to Richmond. Um, people are fleeing Richmond. The government is co th coming apart. Georgia is threatening to secede from the Confederacy. <laughs> and we hear about the costs of things is that uh, a stick of firewood costs $5. A barrel of flour costs $250. They're starving. You know, their Confederate money is worthless. Um, and then there's this moment where General Lee asks that the slaves be armed to defend the Confederacy. And if you're willing to fight for the Confederacy, we'll free you after the war. The I don't even know if it's hypocrisy, but the, the paradox of that idea is so stunning. This is where their morals or principles mean nothing. Yeah. Because e at the desperate end of it, yeah. the people that they most want to enslave and destroy, and Nathan Bedford Forrest killed like in a turkey shoot, here they are arming them in desperation, going, Oh yeah, we'll totally free you if you fight for us. And that's and Lee does that. So please do not let him get away with that. Lee does that. Yeah. And it's disgusting. The thirteenth Amendment passes and abolishes slavery. Um pretty incredible dude. But we saw that in the Lincoln in, in what, the movie, Lincoln, yeah, yeah. What we he did, um, boy, that's a great performance. Movie, not so much, but him, absolutely. It's a perfectly fine movie, <laughs> exactly. But his performance is yeah. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, our last quote on this section is from Frederick Douglass. Verily, the work does not end with the abolition of slavery, but only begins. Frederick Douglass. Talk about prescient. Yeah. I mean. In so many ways. How have we not had a biography on that guy? A biopic on that guy? That's a great point. I bet they've well, tried numerous times. But studios go, no, 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 too controversial, blah, blah, blah. I bet they've tried numerous times. I bet Spike's pitched it like 30 years. Wow. That would be amazing. Morgan Freeman was perfect in the 90s to play Frederick Douglass. Oh, perfect. yeah. Well, and the whole story. I mean, it's yeah. an escape slave. And I mean, like. Come on. Right. And because he met with Lincoln numerous oh, yeah. times. Absolutely. So, yeah. I see the president almost every day. I saw him this morning about 830 coming into business. We've got so that we exchange bows and very cordial ones. I see very plainly Abraham Lincoln's dark brown face with its deep cut lines. The eyes always to me with a latent sadness in the expression. None of the artists or pictures has caught the deep, though subtle and indirect expression of this man's face. There's something else there. One of the great portrait painters of two or three centuries ago is needed. Walt Whitman. We've reached the inauguration, and we hear some of the speech, which I'm just going to play. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. What is Lincoln saying here? Mm. What do you think? The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Well, which means everybody will pay in the long run for what has happened 
and will be judged accordingly by their actions for their actions. And both that, sides. And that all the all the pain being suffered by the Union and the Confederacy, all yeah. the blood that's running through American rivers, yeah. are the not only are they the judgments of the of the Lord, but they are just. Yeah. Do you think this is true? Uh yeah. I think for the most part. You don't think it's true? Well, I'm an atheist, so I don't think there is a Lord. But <laughs> but but even and if you I, can't opine. But even if I did, no, I certainly can. Look. It's our podcast. I can opine. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> this this little recorder has given us. I can also joke about it. So go ahead. Yes, fair. Um, uh, no, of course not. The 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 because it, the the implication within that statement mm-hmm. is that all horrible things ha- that happen to people are the judgments of the Lord, and therefore the Holocaust or a tsunami. Oh, I don't take or, it that way, but okay. I mean, you know that, that all that there could have been the the best, most perfect. Mm-hmm honorable awesome person died at andersonville and that is the judgment of the war of the lord like well, no i you know, to me of course it's not true but i do think well, the framing of it by lincoln is profound yeah you know i think he's saying it's the lord's judgment i'm not saying he's saying it's right or wrong well what is judgment if not a determination of right or wrong well because it, uh, i think he's coming with the job i think what he's saying is that there will be judgment for it on both sides for the actions taken on both sides for what has happened. That's what I think the quote means. I don't think it means whatever happened happened because it was supposed to and so be it and the Lord deemed it so. I think what he's saying is in the few what what has happened here there will be judgment by the Lord on both sides for what has happened. And that's what I think he's saying. Um yeah, it's I mean I think this goes into just one of those critical things that makes me an atheist probably mm-hmm. which is that if you believe in an all just, all knowing, all powerful God, right, and if all of these horrible things happen in the world, there exists within that essential contradiction mm-hmm. that is extremely. And, and it's not like religious scholars haven't spent yeah all of their history <laughs> trying yeah. to resolve this extremely difficult contradiction, yep. which is basically why do bad things happen to good people, you know. Right. And my conclusion of it is, you know, I met my um. I like it the other way. Why do good things happen to bad people? I like it's, that yep, better. Abs- well, it's certainly true. Yeah. Um, I my uncle, my aunt, uh, got cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and as she was getting sick, I was talking to my uncle who's really struggling. And my aunt was Catholic, and uh, you know taught a teacher and just literally the nicest, most lovely mm-hmm. person you could possibly imagine. I, I'm sure she had bad thoughts. I'm sure she did some things she wasn't proud of, but I can't imagine what they were. Right. She she never drank, she never smoked, she never cut a class or did, I mean, like she's just a wonderful, perfect person. And I'm talking to my uncle and he's saying, why would why would this happen to her? She's such a good person. Why would she get cancer? And 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 and, and I'm listening to him going like, well, because they're totally not connected. Right. Her moral life has nothing to do with the fact that Absolutely. she got this terrible disease. And yet, the need to create a construct in which there is a connection between our quality as people mm-hmm. and the things that happen to us in the world. I mean, there is a connection when there's a causal connection. Right. You know, if I treat you nicely, you're more likely to treat me nicely back. Right. But that won't stop me from getting hit by a car. Right. You know? Um, Anyway, let's move on to the second part of his inaugural address. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. To do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Link, it's a profoundly compassionate person. He's incredibly compassionate, yeah. He's not saying, there's nothing in there that says the Confederacy or the Union. It's us. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's bound up our wounds. Let's take care of the widows, not the union widows, all the widows. Right. Let's live peacefully among ourselves. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Perfect president at the perfect time. Yeah, absolutely. The, you know who's, I, I think, who, who carries on this philosophy or carried on this philosophy yeah. is General Marshall. Yeah. And the Marshall Plan. Yeah, the Marshall Plan. The, I think they're thinking the same thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, we've had this horrible war. How do we find lasting bonds of peace? Right. The other person, of course, is Nelson Mandela. Yes. And the policy of truth and reconciliation Mm -hmm. of like, no, we're not going to condemn all the, if these people come and apologize and say their truth, we will forgive and we'll move forward. Yeah. 
And that's from a dude who spent 20 plus years in prison. Mm -hmm. Like that's the, man, that's the stuff from this. This is why Lincoln's my hero. Yeah. And who's standing in the crowd of that inauguration address? John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth. And he's a, I, I, I've talked to Soren about him. Yeah. But boy, is he a complicated, thought he was a coward, mm-hmm. but was a white supremacist, yep. but couldn't in, uh, join the military. Complicated relationships with his family and with, I mean, like, yeah. It's born of a need, once again, it's born of a need of uh, powerlessness. He is powerless because he doesn't know who he is. He is lesser than as an actor toward than his brothers are. Right. He does not receive anywhere near the notoriety that they do. He feels overshadowed by everything in his life. He can't even commit to the one to the principles of his beliefs and act on them. So in this in that one moment, he does something to think he's a he's some kind of something, and he's and he's not. He's a piece of dog shit. And right now, what he's figured out is a plan to. Uh... I, I'm by the way, I'm totally comfortable with you calling John Wilkes Booth a piece of dog shit. <laughs> okay. I have no look, you know I don't like condemning people. You know I want to like look at both sides, but no, no, I'm good yeah. with that. Uh, and he comes up with a plan with kidnap Lincoln and gets together to some conspirators to do it. It doesn't work. And then Grant, Lincoln, and Sherman meet on a riverboat, and Lincoln lays out his plans for peace. If the rebels would lay down their guns and go home, Lincoln said, they should be welcomed back as citizens of the United States. And I love the fact that Sherman had met Lincoln before and he was never a fan of him. And at this point he says, of all the men I ever met, he seemed to me to possess more of the elements of greatness combined with goodness than any other. William Tecumseh Sherman. This is this effect Lincoln has over time with people. Yeah. Uh, Next section, I want to see Richmond. Uh, Lee is stretched at Petersburg. He has 60,000 men, um, all living on half rations and a front of 53 miles long. Yeah. That is a huge front. And Lee's still going. He's still coming. If I can hook up with Johnston in South Carolina, maybe we can find a, a way to, to fight on. We have Lee's last advance up to Fort Stedman and ground counterattacks and just routes him. And this is where the, you know, you got a bunch of, you got smaller numbers, you're on half rations, yeah. you don't have the equipment, you're running out of ammunition, and this is where Grant's just going to keep fighting. And of course, now the people that are fighting for the South, old men and little kids, there was a 14-year-old mm-hmm. shoeless boy that was killed in that battle. The conduct of the Southern people appears many times truly noble as exemplified, for instance, in the defense of Petersburg. Old men with silver locks lay dead in the trenches side by side with mere boys of 13 or 14. It almost makes one sorry to have to fight against people who show such devotion for their homes and their country. Washington Roebling. And Lee sends a message to Davis that Richmond must be evacuated. And they move the capital south 100 miles to Danville, Virginia. And the Union takes Richmond. And Lincoln and his son come to Richmond. Freed slaves mobbed the president, laughing, singing, weeping for joy, kneeling before him, straining to touch his clothes. I know I am free, said one man, for I have seen Father Abraham and felt him. I get teary eyed thinking. Yeah. 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 He walks a mile through the crowd. He sits at Jefferson Davis's desk. And Richmond's, you know, destroyed. Mm Mm-hmm. Um and Lee's army flees, and Grant's just right behind him. He never lets up. Nope. And Lee forms, fights, retreats. Forms, fights, retreat. Davis vows to fight, fight on, where he's going to have a guerrilla war. And, and this is there's this moment where this war could have gone on and on with yeah. little Confederate armies fighting in various areas. But Grant is just breaking Lee. Now it's 125,000 versus 25,000. And he's closing in on three sides. And the generals are saying to Lee, surrender. And he says, what will the country think of me? Mm -hmm. What will the country think of me? Yeah. It's an arrogance born of privilege. What will the country think of me? Well, and experience. I mean, like he's become the central figure of the the Confederacy Mm -hmm. and has been worshipped by his men. Well, you took the decision. You made the decision to lead them. So you have to deal with the consequences and the and the accolades. Well, and I think I think as we've seen in not to compare film directors Mm -hmm. to, you know, Civil War generals, but. The arrogance is necessary to some degree to sure. to tell people what to do and make them do all sorts of work. And in the case of Lee, 
lose their lives, yeah. you have to have a, a belief in yourself that's beyond the ordinary. Yeah. And then it, it also is the, you know, the secret to your demise. Right. And the general's response when he says, what will the country think of me is there is no country. There's been no country for a year or more. You're the country to these men. That's a great response. Yeah. Well, and, and this is the thing too, where it's like, I've been thinking a lot about honor. The idea of honor is that honor the more I think about it, is a quality devoid of morality. It is amoral. We like to think of it as a moral thing. But if you believe whatever your code of honor is, that means I will follow this, risk my life, make all sorts of sacrifice for this thing. But in the case of the South, they're doing it for, to some degree, slavery and secession, which are things that we do not believe in. Right. Does that mean they're not honorable? You know, or... Uh, um, like, I was... There's a documentary I watched a long time ago about Iraq and the... Um, sectarian violence after the u.s uh conquered iraq right and there's an interview with a dude and his voice is distorted and his face is blurred out and he's talking about violence against the americans and the you know attacking the green zone and so on and he says something like since iraq is the birthplace of honor we have to show them what honor really is and i thought about that statement a lot iraq is the birthplace of honor and i thought about how many cultures think that on some level, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's native Americans and counting coup or the Japanese and samurai culture, whatever it is, yeah. you know, all cultures kind of think, no, no, we've got the truth about this thing. And then we have to prove this thing. Certainly the South thinks it at this time, yeah. but that's what I mean is that the thing you're fighting for has very little to do. Like, uh, I, I know I've talked about Hoover was embedded my old documentary partner, uh, with the Mujahideen during the war against the Soviets in the eighties. Mm -hmm. And, uh, at the time we were of course supporting the same people that would become the Taliban and Al Qaeda much later. Um, and that when he first got there, they would go into battle against the Soviets, against tanks and machine guns standing up. Yeah. And the reason they walked in standing up was because a man would not hide. It was about honor. It was yeah. about, it was about a perception of, and then it took a long time to train them from the CIA to say, no, 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 that's not how you, that's not how you fight an insurgency. This is how you fight an insurgency with, you know, bombs and roadside bombs yeah. and all the things that they're using against us. And that they, managed to change what the conception of honor was. But still, regardless of what you say about that culture, it is still deeply concerned with honor. Yeah. And part of it is fighting like the South was thinking about doing at the end of the Civil War to continue to fight the occupying force to the last man. Yeah. You know, and that's of course why we've had so much trouble in Afghanistan for the last 18 years, yep. you know, is that they're not actually going to quit because of conception of honor. Now you could say what you think about the Taliban and we could certainly <laughs> say a lot of reasons why we would not want to live under a regime of the Taliban. Yeah. But again, they are following their conception of honor. Right. Honor is a subjective term. Yeah. And so what you, what a group of people, well, think the cause, honorable. the cause behind honor is a subjective term. I think honor is a subjective term. Yeah. I mean, I think we, there's yeah. a definition thing in here that yeah. probably we're, we're close on, but yeah. You know, I remember as a kid, I was fascinated by samurai culture. Yeah. And the idea of like your liege lord says to kill yourself and so you just do it. And that's that definition of honor. And there's something admirable about the courage and discipline it takes to behave in that way. Yeah. Even though that seems fairly abhorrent. Right. You know, but you can't say that guy's not brave. Right. Or disciplined. The few men who still carried their muskets had hardly the appearance of soldiers. Their clothes all tattered and covered with mud their eyes sunken and lusterless. Yet still they were waiting for General Lee to say where they were to face about and fight. Magnus Thompson, 35th Virginia Cavalry Battalion. We've reached Appomattox River. And Grant writes Lee a very kind letter asking for surrender. And Lee doesn't respond, and there's another battle. Of course, Grant wins. He's now outnumbers Lee five to one. Mm -hmm. Completely surrounded. There's no hope of supply, no hope of reinforcement. And one last battle, and it's over. And Lee says, there is nothing left for me to do than go see General Grant. And Lee sends Grant a, lend a letter that he will surrender. Uh, and when they get it, of course, Grant betrays no emotion. Mm -hmm. I'm leaning towards your on the spectrum thing about him. He is. He has a, or, you know, whether it's on the spectrum or he just has a, a, a ribbon of steel running through his spine. And where do they end up? They end up where we started this whole thing, in William McLean's house, in his parlor. And I love the descriptions. I turned about. There behind me appeared a commanding form, superbly mounted, richly accoutred, of imposing bearing, noble countenance, with expression of deep sadness, 
overmastered by deeper strength. It was no other than Robert E. Lee. Not long after appeared another form, plain, unassuming, simple, and familiar to our eyes, but as awe-inspiring as Lee in his splendor and sadness. It was Grant, sitting his saddle with the ease of a born master, taking no notice of anything, all his faculties gathered into intense thought. He seemed greater than I had ever seen him, a look as of another world about him. Lee's dressed perfectly. He has his last good uniform on. He has a sword. Grant's dressed like a private, no sword. Yeah. Yeah. And Grant describes being depressed and sad for the foe who had fought so valiantly for a cause, even if that cause is one of the worst anyone could have fought for. I love to... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You love to what? That they sit down to talk and Grant small talks. And it's Lee who finally says... Um, we got to talk about this <laughs> surrender thing. Well, because why? Because Grant graduated in the middle of his class, Lee at the top of his class. Yeah. Grant had something to prove. Grant was driven to win here and and did it, and but still has this level of respect for Lee because of his abilities and his um, knowledge and military uh, uh, abilities. He just has that thing so he small talks him probably because he's nervous or probably because like i mentioned earlier he's on the spectrum type of thing so for him the small talk is how he deals with his nerves of the situation or the overwhelming nature of it all and lee probably frustrated at some point was like let's just get this over with because you're dragging out my shame and embarrassment let's get it over with so i can leave here i'll tell you what it reminds me of is that story of the spy where the general couldn't bring himself to make the execution order, and finally the spy had to execute himself. Yeah, 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 good point. Uh, They agree on a formal surrender. Um, It's really good terms for a guy who's known as unconditional surrender grant. Yeah. You know, he lets them keep their swords, they're going to keep their horses, they're going to, you know, like it's a really kind, because this is what Lincoln said he wanted to do on that riverboat meeting with him and Sherman. Colonel Eli S. Parker, a Seneca Indian and a member of Grant's staff, inscribe the articles of surrender for the two commanders to sign. The two men shook hands again. Lee left the house, mounted Traveler, and started back toward his army. The Union soldiers began to cheer. Grant ordered them to stop. The Confederates are now our prisoners, he explained, and we do not want to exult over their downfall. The war is over. The rebels are our countrymen again. And who is the person that receives the official surrender? Major General Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who we now discover is still alive. On they come with the old swinging root step and swaying battle flags. Before us in proud humiliations to the embodiment of manhood. Thin, worn, and famished, but erect. And with eyes looking level into ours. Waking memories that bound us together as no other bond. Was not such manhood to be welcomed back into the Union, so tested and assured? He sees them, again, Chamberlain the same, doesn't see them as enemies. He sees them as, these are amazing people, let's welcome them back. And he ordered his men to salute, uh, which was a token of great respect Mm -hmm. um, from Americans to Americans. In Washington, fireworks filled the sky. A great crowd gathered around the White House and called for Lincoln. He was too weary to make a formal speech, but asked the band to play Dixie. I have always thought it one of the best tunes I ever heard, he said. But all that gets lost when people talk about, oh, the North hates it, the North hates the South, the North hates the South. But like, look at all these overtures of respect. Why does that get taken away? Because that destroys the narrative. Well, and also what happened post-war and the, how, you know, from the radical Republicans, and right. how the treatment of the South. And again, I don't know how you do well, that. Well, Reconstruction was put in by Lincoln. I think if, Re- yeah, I mean, if he had, it's a very interesting world to think about if he had lived. I Well, and also, I, even if Lincoln had been as compassionate as I believe that he might have been, yeah, it doesn't mean it was going to work. Right. Good point. You know, I mean, because the, a lot of times people come out trying to compromise and they just yeah. get the shit kicked out of them. Yep. And the truth is, you know. What do you do with Nathan Bedford Forrest? You know, right, right. what do you do with a, a hood? You know, it's like mm-hmm. we might feel one way about Johnston or um, Longstreet, right? But we're gonna feel, you know, it's just, it, it, you know, and these are the guys you've been fighting against, having this massive slaughter, yeah. for five years or four years. 
And the final moment of this episode is John Wilkes Booth getting drunk. Yeah. We've reached episode nine, our final episode of the Civil War. It is the moment that made the United States as a nation. And I mean that in different ways. The United States was obviously a nation when it adopted a constitution. But it adopted a constitution that uh, required a war to be sorted out and therefore required a war to make a real nation out of what was a theoretical nation as, as it was designed at the Constitutional Convention. Again, thinking about like, okay, I'm Ken Burns. How do I start this episode? The war is essentially over. Yeah. Well, he starts by going back to the Constitution and that the Constitution was born with this flaw. And that flaw, of course, is slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where Shelby Foote says, as we talked about way at the beginning, the United States are versus the United States is. <laughs> and the war made us an is. And we go into this idea that the Confederates believed when they seceded that they would just keep moving south. Yeah. That the Confederacy would grow into Mexico and South Central America and South America. <laughs> and that dream is gone by April of 1865. And we hear, we get like a preview that Elijah Hunt Rose is going to get the best and worst news of the world. Johnson and Sherman will battle again. Uh, we hear about Lincoln and Booth. And then we hear this again. I love the digressions is that we go into this idea that all photographs are made on these glass plates. Yeah. And glass was expensive. And they didn't think those things were valuable. And so they used them in window panes and greenhouses. And they slowly faded away over the years. These priceless mm -hmm. documents of the Civil War were just sitting on some greenhouse fading in the sun. Um, and now the title is 1865, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Even after Lee's surrender, the war is not over. Uh, there's still battles going right. on. Right. 1,200 men died on a, on a ship whose boiler exploded. That's just... You're at the end of the war. Yeah. And 1,200 people die out of this accident. Um, the next title is Assassination. And John Wilkes Booth stops by Ford's Theater and finds out that Lincoln and Grant are coming to see the play that night. Mm. And he comes up with this plan, which is really terrifying. He's going to kill Lincoln and Grant, and he's got his other buddies who are going to go after Seward, the Secretary of State, yeah. Andrew Johnson, the Vice President. I think they went after Stanton, too, although it's not in this documentary. Mm -hmm. And the last minute, Grant decides not to go to the play. Seward gets attacked in his home and stabbed, which is really terrifying. Yeah. It's crazy guy. The other attacks don't go off. And there's this, they talk about before that day, Grant or Lincoln goes to get his photograph taken and the glass plate cracked and it's cracked right at his forehead. And the guy said, Oh, this is a bad job and almost threw it away. Yeah. And that's the last photograph taken of Abraham Lincoln with a crack right through his skull. <laughs> And he looks old. How you can be an atheist is incredible to me in certain moments like that. That coincidence. Do you think that's coincidence? But of course that's a coincidence. Okay. Well, we could go into the meaning of coincidence, but what we don't see is all the coincidences that don't happen. Sure. <laughs> you know? Sure. What's crazy to me, I think Lincoln is 56 when he was killed. Yeah, I think so. He looks like 100 years old. Well, of course. Who wouldn't? Yeah. Presidents who don't go through civil wars yeah. age like crazy in the in the job. Exactly. John Wilkes Booth comes into Ford's Theater. The play is Our American Cousin. Yeah. Our American Cousin. We hear the dialogue from the play. And then there's a really interesting thing about filmmaking that Ken Burns talked about. So you do, if you finish editing your film, you can do what's called the mix. And the mix is where you're going to take all the sound effects and all the dialogue and all the music, and you're going to put them together mm -hmm. and balance out all their audio levels. And this is, a. by the way, if anything could have won a TV should have won an Oscar for sound design. Yeah. This is remarkable because so much of it is created in sound design. And one of the things they have to lay in is the gunshot. Oh yeah. And they're getting, and what you do is you kind of roll back and then you're going to roll forward and you're going to lay something in and you can do what's called punching in and all this stuff. It doesn't really matter mm -hmm. technically, but they've rolled back and now they need to put in the gunshot. And one of Ken Burns's, uh, a woman that he's working with, I, I don't remember what her title was, maybe one of the editors or sound designers. Anyway, she runs into the studio where they're mixing and says, stop, don't do it. And Ken Burns goes, what are you talking about? And then realizes that they're metaphorically about to kill Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. And he goes, hold on a second. And the, the mixing guy at the board is looking at like, what the hell's going on? We right. got, we're on a schedule here. Time is money. Let's go. And, and, and Ken said, let's just wait a minute. And they sat. And held off killing Lincoln for a couple of minutes. Wow. Crying. Yeah. 
And I totally get it. Yeah. And then they laid it in, and there's the gunshot. Maybe I don't know the manners of polite society, but I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal. You psychologizing old man trap. It's just the idea, this is the first president that was murdered, you know, that this could happen. And that's happened at this moment. Yeah. At the end of the war, you know. Yeah. Right. The, 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 the war has not completely ended yet. And Lincoln is assassinated. People stream to the White House. The body stayed in state for a long time. Thousands of people had traveled around the country, the body of Lincoln. He went to New York. Teddy Roosevelt, as a kid, saw the body yeah. of Lincoln. Yeah. And our next title is Useless, Useless, and it is the story of John Wilkes Booth. Finally trapped at a tobacco farm, which is set on fire, and he's shot. And his last lines are looking down at his hands and says, Useless, Useless. Yeah. Uh, the conspirators that killed Lincoln, other than Booth, were... Brought together, they were hung. It took five minutes for them to die. And then Johnston surrendered to Sherman. Davis is run. Jefferson Davis is running, captured in Georgia. Everybody hated him at this point. Of course. Davis was imprisoned at Fortress Monroe in a cell kept perpetually lit and was made to wear chains, though he protested that those are orders for a slave and no man with a soul in him would obey such orders. No sympathy for Jefferson nope. Davis. Nope. Um, and Maybe uh, the biggest coward of the war, in my opinion. And the last man killed in the war was in Texas, and that battle was a Confederate vic victory. <laughs> and that is the end of the, the, the war. The war is now officially ended. On the morning of May 23rd, 1865, the American flag flew at full staff above the White House for the first time since Lincoln's death. U.S. Grant and the new president, Andrew Johnson, stood side by side to watch the grand armies of the Republic pass in review down Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol. The next title, which I find fascinating, is called The Picklocks of Biographers. Um, and we hear kind of the reckoning, 625,000 men died in war. A quarter of the South's men of military age died. Most of them died of disease. In Mississippi, a fifth of the state's budget was spent on artificial limbs. That's just stunning. Yeah. Um, and now time starts to move really, really fast. And we see old men returning to the battleground. Pictures from much later, pictures of old men walking around where they had once fought. And the monuments and memorials are starting to be built. We see Elijah Hunt Rhodes, this, this soldier we'd seen forever. And we see him older. And we see him go from private to colonel during the war, which we didn't know. We had mm -hmm. no idea that he had been promoted to a colonel. Right. And then he's promoted to a brigadier general. And he devotes his life to veterans affairs. And we see him as a very old man. And this is this thing that's going to happen. Yeah. And I don't know how you feel, but this like hits me really hard. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Because you see them just at one moment in life as these young men, and you're mm -hmm. like, oh no, they continued on. Yeah. And we see the same thing with Sam Watkins and his story. Mm -hmm. And then we see Sherman, uh, who remained a soldier, went out and fought Indians in 1883, which we can sure. uh, say, you know, go into what we may or may not think think about that. Yeah. And then here's this quote from him, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. He died in New York City in the winter of 1891. Among the honorary pallbearers who stood bareheaded in the cold wind outside the church was 82-year-old Joe Johnston, who had fought Sherman in Georgia and the Carolinas. When a friend warned him he might fall ill, Johnston told him, if I were in Sherman's place and he were standing here in mine, he would not put on his hat. Johnston died 10 days later of pneumonia. Alexander Stevens, who's the vice president, He's a real horrible, horrible person. Mm -hmm. He gets his old seat back in Congress. Yep. And this is this weird thing. It's like, I agree with Lincoln wanting to compromise, but I also don't want Alexander Stevens back in Congress. Well, that's the thing. Wartime president, peacetime president, are two different things, right? Yep. Clara Barton founded the Red Cross. Yeah. After cleaning up Andersonville and all the other prisons and mm -hmm. suddenly created this thing that obviously stands to this day. Yeah. The commandant of Anderson was hung, was hung for war crimes. Uh, and his response was, I was only following orders. Huh. Phil Sheridan went out west to take on a new enemy, declaring that the only good Indian was a dead Indian. 
George Armstrong Custer went west too, carrying with him his belief in his own invincibility. In 1876, the Sioux and Cheyenne proved him wrong. And this is the thing, it's like, just as we're having to examine how we feel about these Civil War mm. Confederate generals, mm. man, take a look at Phil Sheridan. We might think he was heroic, and he was heroic, and yeah. a great general uh, during the Civil War, and he said, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Yeah, uh, McClellan got elected governor of Jer New Jersey. Beauregard got rich. Uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, his business has failed, but he ran the KKK. Yeah. Longstreet joined the Republican Party and is the only general who criticized Lee publicly, and the South considered him a traitor. <laughs> and he became good friends with Grant. Yeah. Um, Frederick Douglass's last words in this documentary is agitate, agitate. I'm with you, by the way, 100%. Let's get a, let's get a yeah. Frederick Douglass doc. Or a, not a doc, a, uh, a biopic. A yeah. biopic. Uh, Lee swore allegiance to the U.S., convinced his soldiers to do the same. He was weary, ailing, and without work in the summer of 1865, when an insurance firm offered him $50,000 just for the use of his name. He turned it down. I cannot consent to receive pay for services I do not render. And he became the president of Washington College. And his final quote in this documentary is, the greatest mistake in my life was taking a military education. He died in 1870. Yeah. His last words as he went, as he died, were, strike the tent. For he will smile and give you with unflinching courtesy prayers, trappings, letters, uniforms and orders, photographs, kindness, valor and advice, and do it with such grace and gentleness that you will know you have the whole of him penned down, mapped out, easy to understand. And so you have all things except the heart. The heart he kept a secret to the end from all the picklocks of biographers. He's an unknowable guy, yeah. really. Grant had a mixed presidency, and then he, after the presidency, he made some bad investments. He was good buddies with Mark Twain yeah. and lost everything, and Twain convinced him to write his biography. And as he was dying of throat cancer, not able to speak, not able to eat, he managed to crank out his biography, and he died like seven days after he finished writing it, and it restored his family's fortune, huh. which I've never read. I've heard it's a bit of a mess. Oh, is it? Biography. Okay. I haven't read it. Okay. Um, and now we're at 1913, and it's the 50th anniversary of Gettysburg, and thousands of survivors are there, and we see the film. And this is where, again, every time you see this footage, it becomes more and more powerful. And we hear about the reenactments of Pickett's Charge and the, and the rebel yell, and there we see Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Yeah. He's sort of the final guy we really get. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was at the Gettysburg reunion, still imposing at 83, despite almost constant pain from the unhealed internal damage done him by a Confederate mini ball at Petersburg. The reunion was, he said, a transcendental experience, a radiant fellowship of the fallen. He had received the Medal of Honor for his courage at Little Round Top, served four terms as governor of Maine, then became president of Bowdoin College, where he managed to teach every subject in the curriculum except mathematics. He died of his ancient wound in 1914. The war was over. And then we have this discussion of who won the war. Who won the war? The Union Army obviously won the war in the sense that they were the army left standing and holding their weapons when it was all over. Uh, so the soldiers who fought in the Union Army, the generals who directed it, the president who led the country uh, during it, won the war. If we're not talking just about the series of battles that finished up with the surrender at Appomattox, but talking instead about the struggle to make something higher and better out of the country, then the question gets more complicated. The slaves won the war and they lost the war because they won freedom, that is, the removal of slavery, but they did not win freedom as they understood freedom. Four million Americans had been freed after four years of agony. 
but the meaning of freedom in American life remained unresolved. The emancipated slaves own nothing, one Tennessee planter wrote, because nothing but freedom has been given them. And we hear about the promise of the 14th and 15th Amendment and the rise of the KKK. And then we look at the Lincoln Memorial, um, and, a, and one of our professors says, the Civil War is not over until we have done our part in fighting it. Yeah. That it's going to go on forever. Now we get to the 75th anniversary. 2,500 veterans of the Civil War come at the 75th anniversary. These are guys in their 80s and 90s. And they shake hands over the wall, and we hear their voices. Hello! Hello! And then again, we look back at those original photographs. Who knows, he asked, as his narrative drew toward its close, but it may be given to us after this life to meet again in the old quarters, to play chess and drafts, to get up soon to answer the morning roll call, to fall in at the tap of the drum for drill and dress parade, and again to hastily don our war gear while the monotonous patter of the long roll summons to battle. Who knows, but again, the old flags, ragged and torn, snapping in the wind, may face each other and flutter, pursuing and pursued, while the cries of victory fill a summer day. And after the battle, then the slain and wounded will arise, and all will meet together under the two flags, all sound and well, and there will be talking and laughter and cheers, and all will say, did it not seem real? Was it not as in the old days? And that is the end of the Civil War documentary. It's a long journey, John. Yeah. Worth it, though. Uh, I think I said at the beginning there were 39 million viewers. It's the biggest event ever on PBS. And I believe this can't get made anywhere else. Yeah. Only on... This is... PBS, the funds have gotten cut and gotten cut, but man, I still think there needs to be some place that doesn't have to scramble to advertisers and corporate America in order to, and they do have to go to corporate America, yeah. but can make things not because they think they're going to make a lot of money, but they right. can make things because they think they're important. Uh, no, I agree. Uh, but the thing is also what I think is uh, happening is this desire to uneducate the country to underfund these organizations that provide education and perspective and analysis of our actions as a country or the things that have gone on in the history of our uh, nation um, is dangerous. And um, would we get the Civil War nowadays? I don't know. I don't know if there would have been enough. I don't know if enough people would have been behind it. I don't know if we would have gotten the quality and the talent because when it was born out in the age, we were still somewhat of an open country to have these kinds of discussions. And now you hear about states not wanting to teach the Civil War in their curriculum, not wanting right. to teach, saying, oh, it highlights the negativity of America. So what? Uh, the, the, for anyone who even remotely believes that who might be listening to us, do you still not like yourself even though you have fuck-ups? Do you not still like your parents or your family or your friends even though they make mistakes or call, or make errors that could hurt people or hurt themselves? You do, just like our nation. Well, and how do you learn from those mistakes if, if you, you don't know what they are? Exactly. I mean, how do we... And well, and this is the thing, is that fortunately, Ken Burns can still make these kinds of films. Mm -hmm. I don't know if other people can. But, you know, for those, I know we talked about before, if you haven't seen jazz or baseball oh, right. or the Civil War or, I mean, or not the Civil Vietnam War. The Vietnam War. Yeah. Vietnam War is amazing. Yeah. Amazing film. Is, and, and, and the thing is, it's funny. We, at the beginning of the show, I always talk, say the influence it has on us today. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes we do a good job in kind of talking about that. Maybe sometimes we miss it. So first of all, this is a hugely influential documentary in the, in, in the idea of how we approach documentaries. I'm sure if you go to every major documentary filmmaker in the country or even the world and yeah. say, you know, Ken Burns, they go, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. that the, 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 in terms of filmmaking and how to approach it, this is a ground, this is as groundbreaking to me as Citizen Kane. Yeah. You know, it's like there's so much great technique and so much thought. And the, and, and the other thing is that the approach of it is Ken Burns loves nuance and complexity. He doesn't want to paint anyone as 
good guys or bad guys or simplistic. That's why the documentaries are 11 hours, yeah. 12 hours long. Exactly. Because we're going to go in in detail and humanize. If you watch the Vietnam one. Yeah. He has such deep compassion and understanding and desire to listen to everybody and to put forward the facts. And that's how we're going to learn about stuff. Yep. We don't live in a black and white world as much as we want to talk about. Exactly. As much as we want to see it that way. And that we need people like Ken Burns looking at things like this yeah. in order to move forward. Agreed. It's an important, it's an, this has become as a piece of history, as important as almost any text or any, I agree. any document or anything. This, uh, this documentary is as important for understanding the war, understanding what was going on in our country at the time, understanding what was going on in other countries and other parts of the world as well, while we were raging in the middle of a civil war. There's so much here that is important to never forget and to constantly be reminded of, which is why I love the fact that they, uh, uh, you know, made it HD so that you can, so that generations, yeah. yeah, yeah, so the generations behind us can savor it in the best possible way. The other thing in terms of the influence it has on us today, I think we've talked throughout this whole episode of this is the most important event, shattering event in American history. And we are certainly still feeling not only the influence of the Civil War, but the anger is still coming from there. And as we've had debates about statues and memorials or how we teach things in school, the the one thing I don't know, I don't want to get into the whole, you know, political discussion on this necessarily but what i will say is that the way that these arguments have happened have been very much without nuance and that's not how i like to think of things because i love this documentary Mm -hmm. and that if we we need to approach these things with the complexity and nuance of the civil war itself yeah you know certainly not blinding ourselves to any of the truth that's in there because and, and this is the thing is because I mean, you know, it kind of came up earlier in terms of family separations and things that are happening on our border right now. Same thing, man. Yeah. We've got to have the humanity to look with open eyes at what's really going on yeah. if we ever want to solve any of these problems. Agreed. Do you have final thoughts? I think we just did our final thoughts, to be honest with you. All I can say is one last thing is if you have enjoyed our breakdown of the Civil War, and a lot of you gave us so many great compliments for part one, uh, I can't encourage you enough to go back and rewatch it and then listen to our analysis of it again or keep it in your mind and savor these things. And maybe at this time in our country's history with so much anger out there in the streets and on social media and wherever you have, wherever you interact with people, I think watching this will help you understand a little more, give you more pers- uh, perspective on what ha- can happen again in this country if we don't watch out and it's scary to think about and that quote you said earlier in this episode about like well um if we don't do this we'll you know for generations and generations before they think about doing it again sherman we're doing it this way so the generations will think well the generations are starting to think about it again the the term civil war is being bandied about more and more in fact i saw a televangelist the other day a female televangelist say that christians will pick up their arms and fight oh yeah we've heard this yeah yeah now because of you know because god forbid abortion gets passed and all of that is just mind-blowing to me how simple and easy those words come out of their mouths without thinking about the six hundred twenty-five thousand people that died in this war and how their family might die in this war members of their family will die in a civil war it's careless and i hope and i would encourage uh you all, all to like Make sure people you know watch this documentary or people who maybe are having those kinds of discussions or saying those kinds of things. Maybe it'll give them pause. You know? I, I keep struggling to articulate this thing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try again because of what you just said, which I really agree with, is that it's this idea of honor. And we go back to mm. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain on Little Round Tap saying, hold this at all costs. Yeah. And what that means is that whatever the thing you're fighting for is so important that you should not only sacrifice your life, but all the lives of the people that you're with and kill a whole bunch of people because that's how important it is. Yeah. And he's a hero. There's also a point where you should say, I am going to compromise in order to avoid having a whole bunch of people die. Right. Is that are the costs of the war itself greater than the costs of compromise before the war? You know, and this is what we had to struggle with the Civil War, is that had the South not seceded, Lincoln would have allowed slavery to continue. 
in order to preserve the Union. And mm -hmm. even during the Civil War, for a long time, he said, if I could preserve the Union and not free the slaves, I'd do it. And so this is this thing to struggle with of, are we in a little round top situation where we hold this at all costs, willing to sacrifice everything? Or should we uh, compromise and allow the ship of state to continue to sail, hoping that in, yeah. over time, as Martin Luther King said, the arch of history bends towards justice. Yeah, you know, and and I mostly believe the latter. That in general we do bend towards justice. That in general things do get better in half. But there is a certain time where you got to stand and fight at all costs. Yeah, and I think that's the thing I struggle with with the Civil War is. How do you know which one you're at? Because as you say, there are people right now saying we're going to fight to the last man to defend yeah. whatever the thing they're trying to defend. Yeah, you know, and there are certainly causes that I believe are that are happening right now. Bad things happening in the world right now that I believe are worth fighting for. Absolutely. But are they worth creating a civil war and having hundreds? Of, and in this case, with the weapons of today, millions upon millions of death. Yeah, yeah. that's a very very good point. Yeah. And, and the 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 wounds of the civil war. And the anger over that 150 years ago, we're still dealing with today. Yeah. Then, because those are the consequences too. It's not just the consequences of the time. Yeah. Because frequently violence begets violence. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I think that's what we think of the Civil War. I hope that you've gone and watched it. I hope you've enjoyed these two episodes. We certainly enjoyed doing them. We love hearing your comments. So visit the Cinephiles on Facebook. Do a search for the Cinephiles. Um, as always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes and on YouTube. Please read your reviews. They really help us go up in the ranks. You can uh, leave comments on YouTube. We love responding to you there. If you want to support the show, do so at patreon.com slash the Cinephiles where you can uh, pick a movie. You can hear our cinephile shorts, which you've kind of laid off of a little while. We got to get back into doing that. Well, it's 12 hours of a civil war. We have know, it's a lot of stuff we're trying to do. <laughs> um, and if you want to buy the civil war or stream it, please go to uh, cinephiles.net where you can buy or stream all of our movies. Someone was asking on Twitter if there was any way they could do this. And I was yep. like, we say it at the end of every episode, yeah, exactly. cinephiles.net. As always, you can reach me on Twitter at SR Morris, on Instagram at SR Morris one. John, where can they reach you? Yo, you can always reach me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. And uh, yeah, and the top 10, please keep patronizing that. If you haven't listened to it, give it a shot. And the Geek Buddies, the new one I'm doing with Shannon McClung and Michael Vogel, who you both heard on the show numerous times. Go find us at the Geek Buddies, the Geek Buddies, on, wherever you get your podcasts. And I think that's it for this week. We will see you next time on The Cinephiles. <laughs>